All right, I think we are live. We are live, yes. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome to episode number four of Muslim Women in Science and Technology Stories from Around the World. I am super happy that we are on episode number four of this webinar series. And so today's um, episode is actually very interesting, and it's very interesting for me in the sense that all of us do know about environmental sciences and chemistry, but when both of them are combined together, ah, that is just something different and new. And so we have got you this amazing session with one amazing and uh, a, a superwoman in that field, and she will be telling us about what exactly is this field. So I can't wait to begin the session. Um, so we're just going to wait a little bit longer so that more of you can join us, and then we will officially begin. So if you guys have not already watched the first three episodes, you guys are missing out on a lot because we've had some amazing sessions with some amazing women in science. And so it's it's not just that we are trying to, you know, motivate girls and women who are trying to, uh, you know, trying to make a career in STEM, but it's also for everyone. Get excited, get motivated and find different fields in science that you would be interested in and that you would like to pursue a career in. So if you, you know, we mostly hear about, um, um, doctors and medicine in general, but what is regenerative medicine? Have you ever heard about that or are you interested about that? So go check out uh, our session with Dr. Hina Chaudhary. That was one very, very exceptional and very interesting session as well. Second, um, if you are interested in astrophysics and uh, you know what astrophysicist does, but do you know what an atomic astrophysicist does? So why not check out our um, episode number two with uh, Dr. Sultana and Nahir? amazing again and you got some really really amazing golden advice uh, for everyone and then last week we had a completely different um, session and that was with uh, Dr. Mona and it was based on computer linguists, computational linguists and that was again a very different and uh, feel for me and we got to learn so much more so we're just going to wait a bit longer and we will officially begin at 6 p.m. Just a minute longer so that more of you can join us and then we are going to begin. All right, it is 6 p.m. So let's get started. All right, so assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, hope you're doing well. My name is Nimra Khurram and welcome to episode number four of Muslim Women in Science and Technology Stories from Around the World. Uh, so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, let me tell you a bit about what this webinar series is all about. So this webcast series is giving or paying tribute to and celebrating the brilliance and amazing um, Muslim women in STEM. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn about what their work is and not just that, but also get to know about who they are, what their inspirations, motivations and struggles have been to where they are today. So that's about us. But today's episode, episode number four, which is titled Chemistry for a Healthy, uh, for a healthy World, uh, will explore what is environmental chemistry, uh, why do we need to be excited about it, and so much more. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my guest speaker for the evening. 
Um, our Wonder Woman for tonight's episode, for today's episode, is an academic scientist of chemistry and an award-winning professor at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Wilfrid Laurel University, Canada. She is also an adjunct professor at the Chemistry Department at University of Waterloo. She is um, currently the Chair of Environmental Division at Chemical Institute of Canada. She was also the Fulbright Canada Research Chair in Atmospheric Chemistry, Air Quality and Climate Change. She received her bachelor's in chemistry from United Arab uh, Emirates University, Aline, and a PhD in physical chemistry from University of Iowa, USA. This super talented lady has numerous awards and recognitions, including the environmental science leader by the Russian chapter of, of the Society of Environmental Tox Toxicology and Chemistry. I can't even pr pronounce most of the awards she's got. She's amazing. Okay. Uh, next, we have the Women Who Inspire uh, Award, a Women Who Inspire Award for Professional Excellence by Kitchener Waterloo uh, Coalition of um, Muslim Women, as well as the Max uh, Platinum Award of Excellence. I present to you Dr. Uh, Dr. Hind Al Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hind. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Nimra. It is such an honor for me to be in conversation with you, and I'm super excited uh, for you to share what what exactly environment and chemistry is and what your exceptional work is. So I'm just gonna jump right in, and I want you to tell all of us uh, what is environmental chemistry. Why do we need to care about it and be excited about it and your exceptional work? Uh, well, I would love, you know, you're asking me a very a deep question to my heart because uh, I, I like always to share the research and the teaching that I do with uh, with uh, people from um, all over the world. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk with you and to your audience and to the members of the Khawarizmi Science Society. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you tonight. The pleasure is all ours, and we're very, very grateful. Um, if you have slides, um, you can just uh, share them, and I'll put them on the screen. Sounds good. So um, can I get started? Yes, it's all over okay. to you now. <laughs> OK, great. Yeah, so um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, good after, good evening in uh, Pakistan, uh, United Arab Emirates, and uh, good morning um, for Canada and the United States. Um, so it's uh, my pleasure to talk to you today about my topic, uh, Chemistry for a Healthy Planet, that basically summarizes uh, my research and teaching and my professional contributions um, to the community and my outreach activities as well. Um, so let's um, get into that. So I, the outline of my presentation, um, initially I'm going to talk about the inspiration for the work I do. I'm going to talk also about the academic research that I conduct in my lab at Laurier. Uh, the journey, how did I come um, this far in my uh, education and in my career? And um, Nimra asked me to provide my thoughts uh, on Muslim women in STEM, so I'll, I'll I'll have a few slides on that towards the end of my presentation. So I'm hoping that we could uh, stop um, midway to take questions from the audience. So feel free to write the comments, um, whether, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook um, or Twitter, so that we can have a live uh, conversation throughout this presentation. So I'm going to start with the inspiration. So my inspiration uh, for environmental chemistry um, started actually in high school. Um, I, I remember that I have written a 50-page uh, research paper um, on the causes of environmental problems uh, from the acid rain to the ozone hole to climate change and air pollution as well. Um, and I, I remember being affected by the fact that um, human activities emit a lot of chemicals um, into the atmosphere, into the water, into the soil. And as humans, we depend um, on these environmental systems for survival. You know, we need clean air to breathe, we need clean water to drink, and we need clean soil to, for agriculture and for clean food. So I remember I was really very touched by the fact that it, um, the civilization, the industrial civilization, and the industrial revolution have had very bad side effects on environmental systems because of the chemicals that we emit into the environment. 
so I remember that I also have reached out to an environmental advocacy group in the Netherlands uh, called Friends of the Earth. And I remember writing them a letter and sending it by mail. Um, so it took months uh, to hear from them. And they actually replied back to my letter and they sent me brochures and they sent me um, handouts and they encouraged me to stay in touch and, and to keep educating myself about how we can protect uh, planet Earth and the systems we rely on for survival. So at the university, I have taken courses that actually enlightened me uh, on the role of chemistry and um, energy uh, generation from renewable sources, wind and solar, and how chemistry helps us also um, store energy and convert it from one form to the other. Um, in other courses, I have learned about environmental molecular science, how chemicals in the environment interact with each other um, and how human activities affect uh, these interactions. I have also learned in, from my university courses about the principles of green chemistry and processing and how these principles help us minimize the hazardous waste, prioritize safety, uh, utilize new pathways that maximize um, efficiency. Um, and also, and all of these processes can help us um, build a cyclical economy. And on the, so when I became a professor, it was very important for me that I, I conduct research um, that show students how chemistry plays an important role in these three areas I'm telling you about. And also in my courses that I teach, I also highlight um, or prepare students using the fundamentals of chemistry uh, to understand complex um, issues that are facing them in the world they live in. So my, my goal is actually pre to prepare students who, are, who have solid fundamental knowledge in, in, uh, in the role of chemistry in building a sustainable future so that whatever they go in the world, whatever career they choose, or even if they stay um, in, 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 um, in jobs that are far from science, at least they have the fundamental understanding that human activities can have bad effects on the environment. And it is also our activities that can help build a sustainable future. So for me, having um, a literate citizens um, that I deal with is very important, particularly uh, when it comes um, to, the, to the sciences. Okay. Um, so the latest on this topic um, is that uh, if you actually um, look at what the United Nations is doing, you'll see that the Sustainable Development Goals that were launched um, um, earlier, I think seven years ago, um, have very important aspirations um, to, work, to work towards. For example, um, clean water and sanitation, climate action, responsible consumption and production, how to build sustainable cities and communities, um, life, how is life below water and life on land. Um, and there is an important role for, for science to actually play in, in helping achieve these um, global um, goals. And in February of this year, the chemical engineering use of the American Chemical Society published uh, a special issue on how chemistry will help us thrive in a changing climate. Um, and in, in, that, in that issue, they have covered um, guest um, articles that talk about how we can protect the harvest, how we can save the coral reefs, how we can build climate resilient cities and upgrade climate policy, uh, provide clean drinking water, that we ensure we have industrial safety and we make students climate savvy and also engineering resilient crops and finding reasons for hope because if you, if you, are, if you really study um, the impacts of the industrial revolution on the system, you can very easily fall into despair. Uh, but we have, we have reasons to be hopeful ab about the future because now we have the tools, we have the technology um, that will help us build a more resilient, uh, sustainable future. So I invite you to check out this special issue um, and, and to read more about it. So the, the second thing I'd like to jump into is uh, my academic research. Um, so uh, my PhD was in atmospheric chemistry. And actually this, um, this figure that you see here, um, I made when I was a PhD student, when I wrote um, a review article with my PhD supervisor, Vicky Gracian at the University of Iowa, um, where we were really interested to look at the chemistry that takes place at the interface of different phases of matter. So my PhD focused on the chemistry that takes place um, on the surfaces of a tropospheric aerosol. I'm gonna tell you more about that in a, in a minute. Um, but I also got interested to look at the chemistry that takes place at the interface between 
solid and liquid phases, for example, in geochemical systems. So after I finished my PhD, I went to Northwestern for a postdoctoral um, uh, appointment. And there I, I studied more about geochemistry. So when I started my own academic career, I wanted to provide students uh, with the opportunity to know about atmospheric aerosols, about air pollution, about climate change, and the chemistry uh, knowledge that help us understand what happens in these systems. And I also have projects that look at the chemistry of arsenic and phosphorus compounds and organic matter and how they react to the active components in soil and water. And most recently, I started uh, working with uh, other scientists uh, on the chemistry of new materials uh, used for NOx removal and for CO2 removal for uh, cleaning polluted air. So for, for my presentation today, I'm going to focus on these two areas, atmospheric chemistry and geochemistry, um, for the sake of time. So I thought to start uh, by giving you a bit um, of a brief introduction about the atmosphere. Um, so the, the two layers that are the closest to the Earth's surface are the stratosphere and the troposphere. Uh, troposphere is uh, the layer where we live, and it extends from the Earth's surface all the way to about 15 kilometers. And the stratosphere is between 15 kilometers and 50 kilometers, and, it, and each layer has its own importance um, in allowing life uh, to thrive on Earth. So, for example, in the stratosphere, we have the ozone layer. The ozone layer in the stratosphere is good ozone. And um, it is it, the ozone layer helps filters out very harmful UV that comes from the sun so that the solar radiation that gets to the Earth's surface is not harmful to life on Earth. And in the stratosphere, we have special kinds of clouds. They're called polar stratospheric clouds. They are composed of nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and water crystals. And polar stratospheric clouds were found to actually play an important role in storing uh, chemicals from CFCs that unfortunately have led to the formation of the ozone hole. Um, in the troposphere, we have different kinds of clouds. They're mostly composed of water droplets and ice crystals. And I'm going to tell you more about the chemical composition of the troposphere in the next slide. So the air we breathe um, in the troposphere is mostly composed of nitrogen gas, um, 78%, and we have 21% um, oxygen. The other gases that include CO2, water vapor, um, some noble gas such as argon, make up only 1%. So imagine, imagine the fact that um, gases that are responsible for air pollution and gases that are responsible for climate change are only actually making up 1% 1% of the chemical composition of the gases that we breathe. So what does that tell you? It tells you that it's not really the amount, it's not only the amount, but it's also the chemical and the physical properties of, this, of certain gases in the 1% that cause greenhouse gas effect, that cause air pollution, and that cause climate change as we know it, right? So it's very important um, that, that we get this message across. So it, when, we, when we talk about air quality, um, or, or asking what is in the, in the air that we breathe that actually affects air quality, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, all of these gases are emitted from burning fossil fuels. Um, and as a result, they contribute uh, to poor air quality. Here I'm showing you images um, from different cities around the world uh, where heavy emissions from cars and buses and industry activities have resulted in reduction in visibility and in poor air quality in these cities. I was able to find this picture for Islamabad um, uh, in, in the Pakistan Today in newsletter. And, um, and you guys can tell me more because you live uh, in, in the metropolitan cities in Pakistan and you, you ex perhaps you experience uh, poor air quality days um, and you get advisories from your government to stay indoors and, and to watch out for, um, for harmful effects on breathing or if you have health consequences. Now, ground level ozone is, a, is, a, is actually formed in the atmosphere because of the role of sunlight in driving chemistry between nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds in hot, uh, sunny days. And ground level ozone is bad ozone. You really don't want to breathe in um, ozone because it causes inflammation, it causes um, inflammation to the lungs, and it's harmful uh, to health. And the other part, um, the other component in the, in the atmosphere that, that causes poor air quality is particulate matter. A particulate matter, fine particulate matter in particular, um, that can be inhaled and it can reach deep 
uh, into the lungs um, can cause inflammation and cause um, asthma as well. So all of these gases that get emitted from burning fossil fuels contribute um, to what we know as poor air quality days. Okay. Now on the greenhouse effect, um, it is very in, it's very important uh, that when we when you talk about the greenhouse effect that we actually look at the big picture, which is the planetary uh, the planetary energy budget. Um, so this in this um, figure here, what I'm showing you is that the source of radiation to Earth is the sun, and the difference between the incoming radiation and the outgoing infrared radiation from the Earth's surface is, is referred to as radiative forcing, and um, and this radiative force is actually proportional to the change in the average planetary surface temperature. Um, so um, the greenhouse gases that are present in the troposphere, including CO2, including water vapor, um, their role is actually to absorb and emit back the infrared radiation that gets emitted from the Earth's surface. And it is this natural greenhouse effect that allows life on Earth to exist. So, when, he, when the industrial revolution happened and we started pumping more CO2 and more greenhouse gases such as N2O, such as methane, natural gas. And we are pumping these gases at a rate uh, that is much higher than what nature can actually cycle back and, and, and absorb. So what we're doing is that we have a net, um, um, a net abundance of these gases in the atmosphere that causes this enhanced greenhouse effect that causes the climate change effects that we are um, aware of. Okay, so, so it's very important that we highlight the fact that the greenhouse effect in its, as a natural phenomena allows Earth, uh, allows life on Earth to thrive. It is our activities um, that pumps more than what nature can take out of the atmosphere that is contributing uh, or causing um, a climate change. Okay, so this figure here I took I, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and it actually looks at the chemical composition um, of the troposphere that can cause either cooling uh, or heating because of the um, because of their concentration in the troposphere. So what we know is that long-lived gases such as CO2, methane, halocarbons, and N2O um, have um, a heating effect um, on the atmosphere. And, and we pretty much, and the science is good. I mean, the, the size of the enterprise that you see here means that our level, our current level of scientific understanding is, 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 is very good when it comes to the role of greenhouse gases in enhancing climate change. But short-lived gases, such as carbon monoxide and NOx um, have also have been shown to actually have a mixed effect. You know, some will cause cooling, some will cause heating, um, depending on the conditions. Um, but if you look at this other component of the atmosphere, um, aerosols, particulate matter that refer to a, that could be mineral dust, could be um, sulfate that forms from SO2, or ammonium uh, from ammonia emission, organic carbon, black carbon, you'll see that our level of scientific understanding um, is, is relatively weaker um, than what we know from, from greenhouse gases. And this is what motivates research into the role of atmospheric particles in affecting the radiative balance um, of the atmosphere. Okay, this, this uh, video here, I've, I've taken it from NASA, and it actually shows satellite measurements of four types of naturally emitted um, uh, particles in the atmosphere, a black and organic carbon, mineral dust particles from dust storms, sulfate from volcanoes, and sea salt from ocean wave action. Um, so you see from the take home message you wanna take from this video is that particulate matter um, mixed together when they are emitted, uh, and they can actually get transported thousands um, of miles or thousands of kilometers from their um, source regions. In fact, I don't know if you're following the news, we have wildfires in the west coast of the United States, and because of um, atmospheric transport, um, poor air quality have reached um, center United States, and, and some reports came that Toronto is actually experiencing poor air quality because of emissions of the transport of um, the smoke and the particles from the wildfires um, in the west coast so it's very important for you to actually 
when you think about the um, troposphere or the atmosphere is that you you think of a dynamic system a system that's in constant motion um, where chemicals mix um, and therefore and they reside in the atmosphere for for quite some time okay so in this schematic uh, picture here uh, what I'm talking about is how atmospheric aerosols have effects on air quality and the climate so I'm, I'm gonna walk you through it so um, when particles are emitted into the atmosphere, they, they, they're, the major effect is uh, a health effect. So people, if they inhale particles, they experience uh, asthma, or they experience um, and or and they also experience reduction in visibility because of um, because particles can absorb and scatter um, solar radiation. Okay, and this is what we refer to as the direct effect of the aerosol. But also, atmospheric aerosols have indirect effect uh, because they actually play a role in the formation. Um, and lifetime of the clouds and um, clouds are important uh, for rain for precipitation and the location of the cloud within the tropospheric layer affect if there will be a heating or a cooling um, effect and eventually aerosols get deposited into oceans um, into lakes and rivers and and the chemical depending on the chemical composition of these aerosols um some aerosols will actually introduce nutrients um such if they contain iron if they contain phosphorus so that the position of the particles um introduce uh, nutrients um and if, if we're depositing black particles um then that will actually affect the reflectivity um of the earth's surface um when you have when you affect the reflectivity then you actually cause more warming um as well okay so in, so in, in a nutshell uh, the research in atmospheric chemist aerosol chemistry is actually pushing us to understand the changes to the chemical and the physical properties of the aerosols during their residence time in the atmosphere and this is what we call aerosol aging and we really want to understand the different pathways that lead to new particle formation and particle growth because of the fact that aerosols have direct and indirect effects on the climate um and, and their deposition can actually affect the uh, biological um, activity in the oceans and in the lakes now i'm going to switch gears i talk about uh, a little bit about my research in geochemistry um so uh, i've been fascinated by arsenic compounds since i was a postdoc uh, when i interacted with grad students who also have done research in, ars in arsenic interactions with with soil materials so arsenic is an element that exists um in rocks and um, or and and then the weathering of these rocks um, because of um, natural phenomena can release arsenic from these rocks into the water. Now, it's, we can also introduce arsenic to land, um, such as in the United States, it's been used as a pesticide and herbicide in cotton fields um, or on golf courses. Or in Canada, we've used it as a pesticide. Um, arsenic containing municipal waste. Um, can also, um, it comes in different forms, uh, either in landfills because of electronics um, or in actually used as a fertilizer in poultry manure because again, uh, uh, arsenic compounds can be used as an antibiotic and therefore uh, what gets uh, the waste from animals, farmers take and, and, and apply as fertilizer and therefore they introduce arsenic uh, to the environment that way. But the main, the main activities, that the main human activities that actually release arsenic from rocks is mining for gold and copper and lead and silver, and also the burning of fossil fuels and coal. And, uh, and as a result, this arsenic, um, if it's introduced to water, um, it, it, it actually presents um, a major contamination issue. And, and municipalities have to clean up um, that water. But then you have to understand that these human activities introduce a pollutants. And therefore, um, we need to keep track of it because arsenic um, is, is responsible for a number of carcinogenic diseases uh, if it's ingested. So soil, you know, as a chemist, when I look at soil, I, I, I want to know the chemical composition of that soil. So this is one example. Um, so soil is composed of mineral particles. It has uh, organic matter as well. And organic matter also comes in different um, chemical forms and shapes. Um, Homes um, refers to this um, macro um, structure of, um, of compounds that contain different organic functional groups and also organic uh, uh, organisms and also roots. You know, roots are very dynamic systems that can actually exchange um, acids uh, from uh, the soil water 
and 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 can chelate certain nutrients that are important for the plants. Um, so soil again is, is has a life of its own because of its um, chemical composition, and, and I'm I'm always fascinated by how uh, how the chemical composition of soil affect our understanding of the mobility of pollutants once uh, they are introduced into the environment. So because I told you arsenic is a, is a pollutant, um, we have to actually treat um, contaminated water and remove as much arsenic out of it as possible before that water gets distributed um, to people uh, for drinking. And the treatment media um, has to be effective and has to be cheap. Um, so in, in one of the review articles, uh, we see that there are different materials that are used for removing arsenic from contaminated water. And the chemical composition of these removal materials uh, is mostly based, mostly based on iron and manganese and aluminum oxides. And, and therefore, so I, you know, as, as, a, as a chemist, I'm really interested in to know how efficient these materials in removing arsenic and how, how, what is the chemical form of arsenic that will, that will affect the removal efficiency and what are the conditions um, that will give us the maximum uh, removal efficiency. Okay. And so in my research, um, the big picture of, of the research that I do and the significance of the work I do is actually related to the sustainable development goals, um, good health and well-being, um, quality education, um, clean water, climate action, um, life below water, life on land, industrial innovation, uh, when it, um, building sustainable cities that supply clean air and supply clean water, responsible con uh, consumption and production, because there is awareness of how human activities um how human activities affect um you know the, the quality of, of the environment that we live in but also in, in a way you know my presence in in the higher education system and the research environment is also creating awareness around the need for gender equality the need for um recent work and economic growth of, of females um and also partnerships of with other um academics, with other scientists, with community groups, with the industry, uh, in order for us to achieve our big, um, our big goals and, and, and contribution to society. So that basically covers the first two parts of, the, um, of my presentation. I can pause here and take questions before I move to the third uh, component of the outline. What do you think, Nimra? Um, I think we don't have have any question, but I do have one question that I wanted to ask you is that, um, as you said, you know, there's a lot of pollution. Um, so one problem that we face in uh, Pakistan mostly, you know, as the winter time is coming is we have a lot of smoke and that is, it makes a lot of kids and people who have asthma, like, you know, really sick. So what could be, you know, like possible steps we can take or solutions so that we can minimize it this year? Yeah. So. Um, this this is a very important question. So in 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 general, when 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 people are facing an environmental issue, such as what you're describing, smoke um, during winter time, there are two two solutions. Either we look at the problem uh, and and try to solve it at the source. What is the cause of this smoke? Or we can think of band aid solutions. You know, so we have the smoke. What can how can we deal with it at at, at the end? So this is what called what the the end of pipe treatment, or what I call the band-aid solution. Um, you know, when you have a large air pollution problem like this, the fastest way and the quickest way to actually help people or minimize exposure to people is to wear masks. Um, and now people are accustomed to wearing masks because of COVID, but with smoke, you, you really need, I think, special kinds of masks because the smoke not only contains particles, but it also contains gases. And, um, and the masks that filter out the gases and the fine, the ultra fine particles are different than those that we wear for, um, for pr protection from COVID and trans transmitting, transmission of COVID. Um, so masks, but these, are, I don't know how accessible that is, but you know, start with masks as, and, and try to have um, your hands on masks that can actually protect from gases and on fine particulate matter and, and ultra fine particulate matter. That's the band-aid solution. Now the, 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 the problem at the source is where is that smoke coming from? Where is that smoke coming from? If it's coming from industrial activity, then government have to crack down on regulations, on industries that 
that do not have filtration systems uh, that remove the particles, remove the gases and in their smokestacks. Um, but if it's happening in the homes because people, you know, use wood for, for cooking or they use it for heating, then uh, the government has, has to come on board, uh, try to electrify as much as possible um, of this process so that people do not feel the need that they have to burn wood uh, to cook or to heat their homes. So, but, but you know, I think uh, in your situation, there has to be a study. I am not aware of any, but you, you know, maybe somebody in the audience is, a, is more aware than me, is that what are the causes of smoke um, and how can we come together to actually solve it? But you need community groups to work together, you need governments to be involved, and you need industry to come on board um, as well. Yes, um, thank you so much for that. And yeah, that's true. It's just not that one person can make a difference here. If you want the problem mm -hmm. of smoke to go, is everyone has to, you know, collaborate and come together and do that. So thank you mm -hmm. for that. So we don't actually have any question. I think that uh, so far uh, your presentation has been so good. Nobody, everyone's just tuned in and listening. They don't have any questions. So I think we should just continue. Okay, sounds good. So now I'm gonna give you a few, uh, you know, a very brief, um, um, a very brief journey uh, through the path that I've taken so far. So I, you know, as Nimra said, I have finished my undergrad in the United Arab Emirates, but actually I grew up in UAE and I went to their public school systems and the public school system in UAE is, is segregated by gender. So most of my um, classmates and lab mates were women, our girls and the, the teachers and and, the, and and all the school staff were also women. Um, so I got to I got to grow up in an environment that um, uh, that highlights you know um, achievements of, of girls in science and English and religion and history and geography, all the subjects that you can think of. Um, and that also fosters an environment for healthy competition um, between schools, between schools of different cities. So I have fond memories of growing up um, in the public education system in UAE in all girls' schools. And then uh, I, my, my undergrad mentor in the UAE University uh, that you see in this photo here was my connection to the United States because he was a scientist who would go uh, and conduct summer research in the, in the United States with my PhD supervisor. And um, he was the one who actually encouraged me to pursue higher education uh, when I finished my undergrad. So for, for that, I'm, I'm grateful for him and, and, and pray for his health and the health of his family. And um, so I did my PhD and postdoc in the United States. And here is a photo with my mentor, his PhD supervisor, Vigracia, and postdoc supervisor, Franz Geiger, uh, at Iowa and Northwestern, respectively. Um, and and they, both of them were amazing mentors um, who prepared me for, uh, for a career in science, uh, for an academic uh, research uh, career and also instilled of, in, in me how chemistry plays an important role in, in helping society understand the fundamentals and also apply that knowledge to help create a more sustainable future. So in my teaching at Wolfram Laurie University in Canada, um, um, I, I teach courses on uh, related to physical chemistry, uh, which is the why and how reactions take place and how can we measure reactants and measure uh, the, the speed of chemistry happening in the lab. Um, and I get to interact with students from different backgrounds, um, different stories, different parts of, the, of Canada and the world sometimes. Um, and that brings me great joy because they, um, they actually see the importance of the, of the materials I, I, I teach them. And in my lab, um, you know, my, my research, in, um, research is very expensive in science, so I'm, I'm grateful to the funding that I have received so far from multiple sources uh, that you see listed here uh, that allowed me to actually equip my lab with state-of-the-art instruments and to hire students and pay their salaries so that they can work with me on projects um, that they find inspiring and uh, that help shape their own um, career when they leave my lab. Um, and um, so I, I got to do that with a number of students over the years. Uh, it's amazing how time flies. Um, and they all have, have, have gone into great um, uh, positions after they left the lab. Some went into grad school and finished PhD. Some uh, went into game designing. Some went into finance. And um, some went into teaching. Some went into 
being um, lab technicians. So most of them um, stayed in science and, and, and are doing great. And some of the, the, my first students actually is the president of her own company uh, that deals with uh, environmental consultancy. So it's lovely to see them grow and to see them flourish um, after they have um, done some uh, research uh, with me in the lab. And my collaborators, you know, science is very collaborative. If you want to address big uh, problems, or you collaborate with people and and you work with them because each one of you brings a different uh, piece of talent and expertise, and that helps uh, difficult projects become easier. Um, so I'm very grateful to the collaborations that I have had with scientists in Canada and the United States and the students that I've got to work with. Um, who actually allowed us to ask very challenging questions and, and, and work on very ambitious projects uh, that we published together. And, you know, and, uh, scientists are in the business of um, um, creating knowledge, right? And, and we, 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 we compete in that. <laughs> so we compete in publishing original uh, work and, and we brag about where we publish. Um, so this is what I call uh, my wall of fame, uh, where I actually have the um, uh, first page of every paper I published um, since I joined um, Laurier um, to highlight students' contribution. And, um, and I found that some of the work that I have done have also attracted attention of the media. So I, I get uh, frequently asked to um, to comment on stories uh, related to environmental issues with CBC, the local news, or, or, or I sometimes actually write op-ed articles for the local newspaper um, and comment on radio shows um, and also with um, Chemical uh, Engineering, uh, Chemical Institute of Canada's news, um, commenting on recent research in areas that I work in. Um, but outreach Activities also dear to my heart, so I, I get to interact with the wider community through organizing events um, to highlight, you know, to show chemistry demonstrations. Um, I also get to meet uh, with incoming classes of undergrad students uh, to give them tips for success uh, throughout their undergrad education. And I get also to organize um, uh, book launches related to sustainability, related to philosophy of, of and um, social science of environmental um issues um with local clubs um the ones that i'm very happy to collaborate with was the students for sustainability club at laurier that actually had in it science students and business students um coming together for projects and i also am active within my role as a chair of the environment division um, to reach out to the community um uh, and, and and highlight the importance of state-of-the-art science that's done in the field um, I'm also part of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion uh, Committee for the Chemical Institute of Canada, where we get to organize uh, workshops and retreats uh, to highlight successes and challenges facing um, women in chemistry. Um, I'm also part of um, organizations such as Nano Ontario and the Atmospheric um, Related Research in Canadian Universities, where we get to think uh, about the field in general and how we can help early career researchers flourish and thrive and how can we connect with industry and the government so we have conversations in these um in these uh organizations about how academia can come into contact with industry and and government because this is an ecosystem that where everybody is, gets affected and um and I get invited by, by groups such as the one that Nimra has started to talk about women in science and, and to talk about the issues um, that will help create an inclusive uh, environment for everybody to thrive in. And within the Muslim community, I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about highlighting the role of religion and faith in general in driving change at an individual level. So I'm active with Civic Muslims Group um, they invited me once to give a lecture on um, environmental issues in Earth Hour and also within um, the group Faith and the Common Good that brings together interfaith groups to talk about how we can uh, green sacred spaces and, and introduce uh, energy efficiency and genera energy generation from new world sources to places of worship. Um, I also, as I mentioned earlier, I'm active with radios. Um, to talk about the issues as well, to increase awareness within the wider community. Um, and the Interfaith Community Breakfast was kind to invite me to give a keynote um, on environmental stewardship, uh, which I take. 
and and also I contribute I contribute to uh, Muslim outlets uh, media outlets Khalifa.com is a nice Facebook group that I invite everybody to actually check out and keep eye on because it shows uh, successful projects and stories from around the Muslim world and the Western world on how religion can inspire positive change um, and and the Muslim Awards of Excellence um, is also an important organization that came on board I believe four years ago um, that awards um, excellent students um, and professionals uh, for giving a positive image for Muslims within the Canadian uh, society. And, you know, I got also the privilege of actually delivering public lecture to students from age four all the way to age 16 in public and private schools. Um, and because I'm very passionate about increasing awareness about atmospheric chemistry and the chemical composition of the atmosphere and, and climate change and what we can do about it. And I was really happy that uh, these schools invited me to make sure that students get up to date science uh, on these topics. Um, now, the part, uh, so everything that I have told you is what, what people see, right? This is the success that we feel people see, but success is an, is an iceberg, um, is an iceberg. Uh, what people do not see is that the path um, to where I am right now um, was not an easy path. It was not a straightforward path. There was ups and downs. And um, the previous three uh, guests on Nimra's, um, on this webinar series have actually highlighted uh, a lot of challenges uh, that come uh, that come along on, on the path to becoming an independent academic scientist or a researcher. Um, you have to have a certain attitude, a certain discipline, and, and hard work, and, and there will be disappointments, there will be a lot of sacrifice, there will be failures. Um, and, and, but, but, you know, but, but nothing in life, nothing in life that is worth a living for comes easy. So one has to keep that in mind. And, and therefore, um, this, this, the tip of the iceberg is worth all of that <laughs> uh, because, it, uh, because it's very important that actually people have meaningful, lead meaningful lives. And when you lead a meaningful life, whatever comes your way, you, you'll know um, how to overcome because it's the end goal is, is what that matters. And how do you do that? I think it's very important that the mindset that people adopt um, in life helps them uh, achieve the goal. So it's very important to adopt um, a growth mindset over a fixed mindset. And here I'm showing you the slide that actually shows the contrast between these two different types of mindsets. Um, we're, we're, you know, we have to constantly be in a learning mode um, and, and seek challenges and, and not stand still and seek ongoing improvement and to grow from failures and, um, and to accept uh, effort as a key to success and to learn from others' success. Um, so all of these factors come into play um, on, on your journey to becoming the best version of yourself that you can be. Um, so my last, um, last part is my thoughts on Muslim women in STEM. Um, so I think when you asked me Nimra, on my thoughts, um, these are the, the major key points that came to my mind right away, is that Muslim women come from highly ethnic, diverse groups, um, and very rich cultures, very rich history. They know that faith and science go hand in hand uh, for humanity to progress materially and morally. Um, Muslim women have untapped potential and talent. Uh, whether they are in their own in their home countries or where they have immigrated to other countries, they are still an untapped source uh, of talent uh, that society is actually missing out on. They have those who actually continued on uh, and chose professional careers um, to stay and, and challenge the status quo, um, have exceptional tenacity and resilience in the face of dark forces. And I say exceptional because, you know, I, I have come across people from different cultures and it, it fascinates me um, that Muslim women in particular have an exceptional level of tenacity and resilience um, because the, the levels, the levels of oppressive forces that come their way is unprecedented compared to what, what other women face. Um, and therefore, the fact that they can succeed uh, for me that is a, that's a reflection on their tenacity and resilience they are unsung heroes um they are they, they receive insufficient publicity and recognition 
Um, and, and that's what, bring the, what, what brings uh, very high importance on the webinar series that NIMRA is hosting. And I, I wish that everybody will support NIMRA in this, in this effort. So 20 years ago, uh, Science Magazine, which is one of the prominent uh, magazines in the scientific world, have published this article, Islam, Islamic Women in Science. And in it, the author, who's a professor of geology at the American University in Cairo, says that gender-based discrimination coupled with social and cultural barriers, limited access to participation of women, mainly hinders um, their ability to be full participants. Now, eight years ago, another article came in Science, and uh, this time with the title, How Women Scientists Fare in the Arab World. And I actually know that came out in Nature, apologies. Um, and here it says, true equality for women scientists requires recognition of their family roles as well. And one must not fall into the trap of transferring solutions from one culture to another. This year, um, Sumaya bint al Hassan, who is a, a princess in Jordan, um, and she's the president of the Royal Scientific Society, um, published an article in Science where, where, where she says that religion and culture are not the strongest determinants of Arab nations' approaches to women's education. The systems and resources are. And to choose only religion or ethnicity over economics and prosperity is both uh, careless and damaging. So, uh, so you can see that over the years, um, Society is still struggling with full participation of, of women, uh, Muslim women, um, in, in, um, in science and in the development of the economies. There have been improvements at every country um, in different, um, to different degrees. But in general, um, there is a leaky pipeline. Like this is a, a statistics that I took from the UNESCO Institute, where, and, and these are worldwide statistics, right? So in the bachelor, at the bachelor level um, for um, women in higher education and research, they fare good. At the, at the master's level, um, there is a, a slight reduction. At the PhD level, there is more reduction. But then for them to continue um, and, uh, in a career that is related to research uh, becomes, uh, this is where most of the loss happens. Um, and, and the statistics for 2016 for female science researchers for the world, 29% um, women science and researchers. Um, but if you look at where Pakistan, for example, is counted with, it's counted maybe in South and West Asia, that's 18 or 19%, right? In North America and Western Europe, about 32, uh, 33% of the percentage of, um, of females in science researchers. So you see different regions around the world um, have different statistics. Um, and that, that's why there is no one size fits all. Every society has to come up with their own uh, policies uh, to maximize the, the, you know, the use and the uh, integration of, of these minds um, into their system um, so that they build, to help build resilience, uh, resilient society. And there have been efforts on that front, particularly for uh, to highlight the achievements of Muslim women over the ages. W 1001 inventions. Um, recently, I've, I found this uh, piece where they talk about Muslim women from the golden age of Muslim civilizations, a beautiful um, website uh, that I advise everybody to actually check out. And, the, and, and you see other initiatives that are taking place. Um, in North America. Um, so there's a Center for Arab American Philanthropy that provides scholarship funds for Muslim women um, to continue in STEM. Um, the Islamic Development Bank um, also provides scholarships um, for um, students in need to continue um, um, in science. And in Canada, we have Max Scholarship Fund, the Olive Tree Foundation, and Daughters for Life Foundation that also provides scholarships for um, high school students and university students um, study uh, and to continue in the scientific field. And recently I found that there are actually media outlets um, that highlight the importance and the achievements of Muslim women in STEM uh, within uh, the Western world. Um, 
and 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 I found these initiatives heartwarming, and I encourage more of them because we need uh, the media to be on the side uh, that highlights the achievements of Muslim women in science in general. Uh, so, you know, so Nimra is doing a great job. Um, Wikipedia is an important outlet that people can also capitalize on, and your Sultana Anhar. Um, uh, Dr. Sultana Nahar, I have, have also mentioned during her talk that she is the founder and president of the International Society of Muslim um, uh, Women in Science, which is great. And um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, these are the types of initiatives that we need to educate the world and to show the world what Muslim women are capable of. So that comes to the end of my presentation. Um, so I would love to hear your comments and interact with you now. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hint. That it, it warms my heart to know that you actually watched the first three episodes of this series. It's just, uh, it means so much that you've actually watched them. So thank you so much. And honestly, um, the second part of your presentation, you actually presented everything that all the girls probably watching right now and me, myself as well, uh, like the iceberg example. Yeah. To the point. Exactly. This is exactly, I think people don't understand that there's so much that goes behind what you actually yeah. see and that's so yeah. true and especially the mindset uh, that is something i think all of us need to change it's not just mm -hmm. women who are working in the field but also everyone else involved because we need the support to be able to do what we want to and be able to get where we want to get so i get mm -hmm. and i i think there is nothing left for me to comment about it was just really really amazing and thank you so much for watching the episode. I'm just, I'm starstruck that you watched them. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm happy that you have me as the fourth uh, speaker because I felt that, you know, <laughs> these are wonderful women that you invited, the, the, the three, the first three. And I felt that I ha I've had a huge responsibility to actually, you know, rise up to the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've done brilliantly. You've done brilliantly. So now I'm going to move on to the second um, segment, which I like to call a heart to heart. And this is where we'll get to know more about you, you know, your casual non-scientific self and also get to know about the struggles that you, you know, you had to overcome. All right. So my very first question to you is that did you always know growing up that you wanted to be a chemist? No, actually, I did not. I, I, what I remember is that the chemistry decision came in, um, in high school. Uh, what I know growing up is that I was really good in, in, in math and in science, and I was good in other in the arts subjects as well. But see, um, my my teachers, I think, had a very big influence in me because they said that if you are good in in the arts and in the science, then you definitely should stick to the science. And I feel that this is really um, different than Western societies because in, in our culture, um, to, to act, if you have, if, if teachers identify students with an analytical scientific mind, they make sure they stay in the science and analytical field. Um, and I think I was one of those students. My teachers recognized that in me, my family recognized that in me, and, and they pushed me in that direction. Um, to actually stay in it, uh, and therefore I just focused. I focused on the sciences. The, um, and in high school, of course, you get exposed to chemistry, to biology, to geology and physics. And, and I found chemistry just to be the perfect fit for me because I found biology to be too wet. I didn't, I didn't like that the digestion and the, I, th I found that very gross. <laughs> um, mathematics, uh, I was good in mathematics, but for me, I, I felt that I like really to see where these equations are applied. Physics for me was, there was an application of math there, but for me, it felt too dry. Chemistry just seemed perfect. You know, it, it shows the right application of mathematics and it shows how it is applied to, how, to understanding life in general and how our body functions and how uh, chemicals interact with each other. So I felt chemistry was, chemistry seems just to be the right fit for my, for how my mind thinks. Yeah, that's definitely right. I guess um, teachers do, teachers play a lot of, like a very important role as to, you know, what we want to do. They sort of shape us and put us on the right path to where we, mm -hmm. you know, how we should invest our energy in. All right. So next question is, what is the toughest hurdle you had to face to get to where you are today? I think, you know, uh, immigration um, and leaving my family and friends uh, at the age of 21 was, I think, the biggest challenge I've, I've faced, uh, grow, you know, in my life th throughout 
to achieve my goals, to achieve my, uh, you know, my dream of becoming a, a scientist and an independent scientist. And that, that, that experience have shaped a lot in my personality because it come it came at a very early age. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it equips you with, again, resiliency, with tenacity, uh, with the drive. Um, and it tests you because if you if you're really that passionate about achieving the dream that you say that you have, then whatever comes your way is worth um, coming around. It's worth and your dream is worth fighting for. Yes, definitely. Okay, so what advice would you give to those big dreamers sitting out there, but they're facing a bit of trouble, but they're like really passionate, big dreamers. So what is like one golden advice you'd give that, you know, you stick on to this and you'll make it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having dreams, having dreams in life is very important because I, I, dreams are source of hope, right? But at the same time, if dreams can evaporate, if we do not couple them with action. So we, having a dream is great, then just try to have steps, concrete steps, one by one. Remember the thousand miles starts with a step. So goals, you need to set goals. What can you do every single day that will bring you closer to achieving your big dream? Uh, start local, you know, get support from your family and friends. Make sure that you surround yourself with people who can understand your vision for life, who can support you in it. Um, your circle, your peers are very important. Um, choose those who can, who, who will push you towards it, who can help you achieve your goal and filter away anybody who do not, does, does not have a belief in your abilities or a belief in your ability to actually achieve your goals. So it's very important that you do that and always link it with action. Dreams without action evaporate, nothing is done and you feel helpless. Uh, but dreams with action will tell you that, no, actually today I've achieved this, I'm, I'm closer. Even if it's, it's a thousand miles, no, you're actually one step closer. So always keep an eye all on the ha on the glass half full, the glass half full. Always keep an eye on the glass half full and work to work um, toward your goal every single day. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And yeah, it's very important for us to be hopeful. I mean, no matter what happens, you know, keep at it. So thank you for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, ask you some random silly questions. Okay, <laughs> are you ready for those questions? <laughs> okay, we'll see what they are. <laughs> All right, so the first question is, um, what is your favorite element and why? Oh, yeah, iron. Iron is my favorite element. And um, I, I, I just, I'm fascinated by this element. I mean, it's, it's naturally abundant. It's in, in, it's in the rocks. It's in the water. It can be in the particles that we breathe. And the fact that I, you know, so I want to specialize in iron research because Perhaps one day people will call me the Iron Lady, so I find that a very nice catchphrase. <laughs> oh no! Okay. I think that's already that already belongs to Dr. Sultana. You'll have to probably modify a bit. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I'm a chemist. She's a physicist, so we'll we'll have to fight over who who claims iron first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it may be really cool to have that name. Yeah, I was also yeah. very like excited to learn that she has this Iron Lady name, and I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. <laughs> um, if a genie could grant you a single wish, what would your wish? Be? Wow. Yeah. So that's oh, oh yeah. That, oh, so many comes to mind. So many wishes. So many wishes. Um. Well, you know, I'm, I wish I wish for peace and justice in the world. But I, I totally understand that you cannot have peace without justice. And I would ask that genie to make sure that justice is established. Because if you have justice established, then peace will, will be the consequence. Well, that, that is very, very inspirational. And I hope that genie comes and then fulfills that wish very soon because we need justice in the world right now. <laughs> All right. So the last question. <laughs> it's a more of a science fiction sort of a question. So as we can see, like there's a lot of climate change right now. It's not science fiction, but it's the thing is like it's more futuristic. So mm. we know there's a lot of climate change. And as we can see, there's a lot of wildfires. We have a lot of hurricanes coming 
uh, as well. Mm. So do you think that in the future, the earth is going to become inhabitable for humans? And what is your opinion on like, what is the future, near future of planet Earth? Yeah, this is a very good question. What I see is that citizens at a, a, at a city level, at a municipal level, are, are convinced with the science and are ready for action and are ready to take action that will help them uh, in, help their kids inherit a more inhabitable, inhabitable earth. What's, dry, what's, steady, what's, sta what's standing in the way is political will. It's political will. And therefore, I, I think that if we continue in the path that we're continuing on to, we are going to miss a, a very huge opportunity to actually shape or prepare the climate system or the environmental system to help heal itself. All we, need, all humans need is to actually back off and slow down their economic activity. Uh, this is what happened with the ozone hole. When the, when the world came together to say no more CFCs, we're not gonna emit CFCs, the ozone hole started to heal itself. And we started to experience, we see the healing signs after 30 years from the, uh, from the Montreal Protocol. So nature has the ability to heal itself. All that we know, only what we need is human activities to actually acknowledge the mistake that they've done and to retreat, you know, slow it down and, and to do the switch, to do the switch to more, you know, renewable energy sources um, and, and cyclical economy. We, we, sh we should actually examine our consumption behavior and not, not consume and pollute and, and, and without thinking of consequences. We need and we need that happening right now. Right now, the technology is there. We need to hold our politicians accountable because we're talking about the future of generations to come. You know, they talk about 2050 when, when the year that we're going to have the catastrophic changes if we continue on this path. You know, I'll be a senior a senior person then if I was alive, and but the, but, but people who are born now will be in their most productive years, and therefore. What is the type of earth we want to inherit other? What is the image that we want future humans to say about us? Are we just, they will look at us and, and, and will say, oh, look at them. They continue to burn stuff when they knew the impact, the, the bad effects of the burning that they have done. What were they thinking? I know we don't want that image to be the history that we're going to uh, pass on to future generations. Yes, definitely so true. And I think that like right now the youngsters are more like woke about it as the words going around they're more woke about the environmental changes and there are a lot of uh, youngsters who are actually you know campaigning for this and i think that we understand and we realize the importance and i hope that the elders who are listening to this um play pay a bit more attention to our future as well uh, okay. because we will be inheriting the earth um so uh, thank you so much dr hind that's and my random questions and so I'm going to look for more comments if you have any questions from anybody. Mostly okay. there's like so, so much of support coming right now. Mostly okay. because everyone is very happy to hear women um, scientists getting acknowledgement. And the, the point that you raised that, you know, media and all, a lot of uh, sessions should be done uh, to recognize the work uh, that female scientists are doing, Muslim women are doing particularly. So we're getting a lot of support uh, in the comments. Um, I really don't want to end uh, the session, but I think I've got to because we're more than an hour's mark. So thank you so much, Dr. Hind, for joining us, taking us the time and telling us and making us aware of this um, new field. I mean, it's relatively new for me because, you know, we know environmental sciences, chemistry, but it was so Im interesting. And thank you for sharing your journey with us. So if there's any message you'd like to, you know, give at the end before I conclude, so please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, I, I Edinburgh, for this opportunity and for your audience for being active participants. And and um, I, you know, my my only uh, my only advice that I want to leave the audience with is to be hopeful about the future, to know that we are you know uh, to learn from the wisdom of the elders in our community, and to also uh, be tech savvy so that we know that the technology is our disposal to affect positive change. Uh, we need to be grounded in ethics, and to always look at our faith as our source of ethical guidance um, in order for us to build a just world. Uh, the genie, there is no genie. I mean, the genies will not come and make my wish come true. It's humans who will actually make my wish come true. And therefore, you know, being Muslim, and, and we look at our religion as a source of ethical guidance, I encourage every one of us to actually go and examine the message in our religion that will help create and helped create a, um, an ethical civilization that lasted for 800 years 
without causing an impact on the environment like the Industrial Revolution have caused within 200 years. Uh, so I want you to reflect on that, reflect on your history, and you will see that we have evidence from history that civilizations can flourish for thousands of years and hundreds of years and leave, and leave beauty and not leave destruction, right? And now we are in the 21st century. We have technology at our disposal. All we need is to be equipped with ethical guidance, and we have the sources for ethical guidance. And we, ha we can work towards a more just world and a more healthy world and a more sustainable world. So I am counting on you and I am um, I'm available for, for, for consultation and for wisdom if needed. And I learn from everybody regardless of their age. And I, from the youth, I love working with youth because this is what I get my energy and hope from. So I wish you all the best. Uh, thank you so much. That was so lovely and heartwarming. And, and yeah, we at K uh, Cases would love to again also collaborate with you with our own uh, future projects and maybe, you know, pick your brain about some other things related uh, to this field as well. So thank you so much for taking out the time and thank you to the audience for joining us. So I'll catch you uh, next time, inshallah, with another uh, brilliant woman in science. So till then, Allah Hafiz.